I think we should be recording now. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right, so first of all, hello everyone. I hope you're well and thank you for joining today's talk about a local celebrity, the artist Paul Sample. My name is Sophie Richard and as Roger said, I'm a recent graduate from Smith College where I received my BA in art history and archaeology. I've been very interested in American art post-Civil War and into the turn of the 20th century because this was a moment of rapid aesthetic experimentation as America grappled directly with the question, what makes American art? If you joined us a few weeks ago when we discussed women artists in the Cornish art colony, we saw Gilded Age artists define it through opulence and ideals. So when Roger told me that our library has a Paul Sample watercolor, I was excited to learn more about Sample's place in American art. During Paul Sample's career, the prominent artistic movement was the American scene, which is really an umbrella term for two styles, American regionalism and the politically oriented social realism. Paul Sample is best known as a regionalist painter, depicting scenes of typical American life and landscape painted in a naturalistic and descriptive style and really looking into the country's more rural and agrarian roots to define nationhood. These are all very fluid and difficult to define movements that had a variety of style, and the artists often altered their techniques to fit new landscapes. Therefore, this water, watercolor represents only one of maybe three or four styles that Paul Sample explored. This will be a chronological presentation in order to differentiate his styles and track their change with a focus on his studies of Vermont and the Upper Valley. So after some brief introduction and background to his career, we will go through watercolors and oils in chronological order. And I'll ask you to think about how his relationship and understanding of Vermont changed over the years. Here is Sample's house on Hobson Road in College. Sample and his wife Sylvia built this structure along with a barn and studio in 1939 during Sample's artist in residency at Dartmouth, which we'll talk about very soon. Hobson Road boasts some really impressive low slung modernist homes between 1945 to 74 in the mid century modern style. The Norwich Historical Society has great information about this neighborhood on their website and even more about Paul Sample. One can really tell this is an artist's home as it's a celebration of fun angles and juxtaposing lines, which interestingly enough are two very important features of his artwork, which we'll see soon. This slanted roof style is called a shed roof, which supports the angle of the house built into a bank. And these very fun wraparound windows are called Claire Story windows, which are very close to the roof line. As you can see, there have been a few changes over the years. Certain elements are now missing from the home, but it's still lovely structure. I'm not exactly sure when this picture on the right was taken, but there is certainly a more established garden and of course a great view of the town of Norwich. Here is a brief overview of Paul Sample's life and career as an artist, and we'll come back to this to understand some of his experiences and their influence on his art. He was born in Louisville, Kentucky, but moved quite a bit over the years as his father, Wilbur Stevenson Sample, was a construction engineer. His younger brother, Donald, was born in 1898, and they remained very close throughout their lives. Paul Sample entered Dartmouth College in 1916. He wasn't sure what he wanted to study, but played basketball, football, prided himself as a heavyweight boxing champion, and later took up saxophone and formed a jazz band with his friends. The United States declared war on Germany in 1917, and Sample served in the Merchant Marine on the SS Republic between 1918 to 1919. This really interrupted his studies for a full year, but he returned to Dartmouth to complete his education and graduated in 1921. His brother Donald became very ill with tuberculosis and was sent to a sanatorium in Saranac Lake, New York. After graduation, Sample himself became gravely ill and joined his brother where he remained from till 1925. And this is an important part in Sample's personal life as well as his artistic career, because this is where he found a love for painting. With funds from the Veterans Bureau, Sample moved to New York and studied at the Greenleaf Art School. Donald had been moved to California in hopes that his condition would improve with the warmer climate. However, his health quickly deteriorated and Paul was requested to come to California. Unfortunately, Donald passed away later that summer. 
Now in California, Paul struggled to find a job, but supported by the Veterans Bureau, he studied painting at the Otis Art Institute in LA. He then began to teach drawing in the School of Architecture at the University of California, and by the mid-1930s became chairman of the art department. And this really speaks to his artistic career and his talent. About five years ago, he picked up his first paintbrush, and now he's chairman of the entire art department at a prestigious university. Paul had met a young woman named Sylvia Halland, a Vermonter from Montpelier, while recovering from tuberculosis, and had kept up correspondence. Sylvie came to California to visit Sample, and in 1928, the two were married. Sylvia's family was from New England, and the two frequently visited, reintroducing Sample to the landscape he admired. In 1932, the prestigious Stendhal Galleries in LA agreed to exhibit his paintings. This was a substantial career move, as Stendhal represented up-and-coming artists of the day, and allied Paul Sample with social realists and regionalist painters those styles under the umbrella of the American scene, which were incredibly popular uh, during and post the Depression. Sample is among the artists invited by the section of painting and sculpture of the Treasury Department uh, to submit designs for mural decorations for the new headquarters of the Post Office Department in Washington. Sample was asked to paint murals for other Treasury Departments following this, showing that the administration enjoyed and appreciated his designs. Sample was then granted, uh, granted a sabbatical from UCLA for the academic year 1937 to 8, where he toured the nation's courts for several months, uh, working on a commission from Fortune magazine. However, in 1938, he accepted a position as artist in residence at Dartmouth College, where he had a studio at Carpenter Hall, and he and his wife, Sylvia Helland, rented an apartment in Hanover. Though not required to teach, he offered watercolor classes for Dartmouth students and gave lectures on painting to alumni. In 1941, he was recognized for his talents in an illustrated spread in art news, received accolades from the artwork, and his designs were approved for the post office mural in Rhode Island. That same year, the samples moved to their home on Hobson Road, which I showed earlier. During World War II, Sample took several leaves of absence from his position at Dartmouth to serve as an art artist correspondent for Life magazine which published several of his paintings of soldiers at work, at rest, on land, and at sea. Sample began his first assignment for Life magazine with the Department of Naval Aviation. He produced watercolors of naval air stations at Norfolk, Virginia, and later was sent to Pearl Harbor to do sketches of the activities at the base. His credentials were upgraded to permit him to accompany task forces anywhere in the Pacific, and spent two weeks on the submarine SS Trigger on patrol, on patrol between Pearl Harbor and Midway Island. He was on board USS Portland during the invasion of the island of Leyte in the Philippines, and Sample spent a lot of his time on the front lines and reported what he saw. This image on the screen is a watercolor he completed while healing from a leg wound in a church converted to a hospital in the Philippines. Sample's post-war Post-war art reflects his deepening ties to the Dartmouth community and local surroundings, as well as a growing awareness of new stylistic approaches, which we'll see as we look through his work. Sample returned to New England and settled back into painting, exhibiting widely and completed several large-scale murals, including scenes of Vermont for the National Life Insurance Company building in Montpelier. And this was Sample's largest project at eight feet tall and 50 feet wide. This picture certainly does not do it justice, but you can find images of the mural on the Vermont Historical Society website. In 1962, Paul and Sylvia sold their home on Hobson Road and purchased a large one-story house nearby and officially retired from Dartmouth. And this made him the longest serving artist in resident at the college. However, he was given a studio in the Hopkins Center and presented with an honorary degree. By the late 1960s, Sample's health was failing and he turned down several commissions. However, he continued his daily routine of sketching or painting in the morning. On February 26, 1974, he suffered a heart attack after dinner and passed away. I hope this has given you an introduction to his life and career. This was certainly a truncated version of his achievements, but it established Sample as a serious and well-exhibited artist with a foot in the academic world as well as in the artistic. This next section will be discussing different interpretations of the style, 
as well as doing some close looking at some of his depictions of Lamont and the Upper Valley. Let's go back to his time at Saranac, New York, where he remained from 1921 to 25. This is where Sample picked up his first paintbrush under the tutelage of Jonas Lai, a Norwegian-born American painter who was staying with his wife while she was undergoing treatment for tuberculosis. Lai was known for his colorful paintings of city scenes of New York and of beautiful coastlines in New England. And he is really known for his neo-impressionist style. For those who are familiar, his color and tone are similar to that of artists Henry Oswa Tanner and George Bellows, both artists interested in depicting reflections and refractions of light in urban and natural scenes, and really getting to the heart and evoking a mood um, through these selected scenes. We really, we do have to thank Mr. Lai for encouraging Sample to paint. In Paul Sample's memoirs, he uh, he says that at Dartmouth, his, he slept through his only art history course and wouldn't have gone back if it wasn't for Jonas Lai. We can see Lai's impressionism influence in this sample, which shows a congested harbor scene. This is the first style that Sample experimented with, and you can see similar movement and bright color. But we can also appreciate some of the differences which set him apart. La, uh, this is certainly not the impressionism that we saw with Lai, we can define this sample painting as an interim style. It's not the regionalism he'll be known for, yet it's not quite as abstract as Lai. As you can see, Lai did not focus on figural studies or including individuals in his scene, while here we can see dock workers, fishermen, perhaps tourists, etc. This will be a reoccurring theme in Sample's early work, which we can see in this, this painting completed in 1931. Sample, like most American artists and Americans of the period, were strongly affected by the collapse of the stock market and the subsequent onset of the Depression. Sample rejected nostalgia and ideals, and he turned his attention to the activities of urban life and the second style we're going to explore now. This style was known as social realism, as it addresses contemporary ur urban life in America and must be seen from his years spent in California while teaching at the university. Unemployment is similar to George Bellow's work, Cliff Dwellers, which shows a congested scene in New York City's Lower East Side. Bellows is commenting on New York's increasing population density and the effect of industrialization on tenement living. So while these two are addressing different issues in different cities, both artists capture the commotion and problems in civil society. Paul Sample most likely came across this Bellows in person while visiting the Los Angeles County Museum which is then the Los Angeles Museum of History, Science, and Art. It was very close to the University of California. So just a, a brief recap. We've seen Sample explore a quasi-impressionism theme and style, which was um, encouraged by his uh, mentor, Jonas Lai. And now he's really experimenting with social realism, packing people into the scene. Each individual, there are no individuals in the scene. Everyone's face is blurred. It's indistinguishable. The mass is the really important thing here. Sample style, however, was yet to change again for the third time as he focused on landscapes and away from the gritty urban scene. This type, type of stark regionalism is called precisionist landscape or documentary realism. It's devoid of human activity and instead renders agricultural and architectural details in crisp clarity. Going back to the question I raised at the beginning of this presentation and last, what makes American art? It is clear that Sample's role as an American artist was first to record the people and now to record the agrarian industry, the solidity of architecture, really trying to find those roots in America. Uh, Sample defines American nationality through its material accomplishments. And this is, it's interesting because it's a similar sentiment to the Gilded Age, however in a completely different mode of expression. This style is similar to art and artists we may be familiar with. A novel by Grant Wood and many of Norman Rockwell's paintings, which demonstrate that hyper focus on those crisp, clear lines. All three of these artists utilize precisionist detail and all are known as regionalist painters. During the late 30s, Samples traveled with his wife, Sylvia, across the country a few times. And I think we can see through the colors and landscape that Sample was trying to capture the essence of the Midwest and mountain regions. With the election of Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1932, 
the art of regionalism and social realism was adopted by the administration as an appropriate visual expression of its social and economic programs. Paul Sample, Grant Wood, and Norman Rockwell all painted their share of New Deal murals in businesses and government buildings. So we can gather that Sample's location in conjunction with the rise of Works Progress Administration and the Federal Arts Project had a prominent effect on his style and active interpretation. This is demonstrated once again with uh, a change of style. And this change accompanied uh, his and Sylvia's move to New England and Sample started his residency at Dartmouth in 1938. This is a different approach from the stark landscape we saw before. We can, see, we can still see Sample's early interest in people and figures as they crowd and mill with one another, while those harsh and crisp clear lines are softened due to the medium of watercolor. However, this is still under the umbrella of regionalism, with a strong focus on small town life and really getting to the roots of American identity. This is one of my favorite works by Sample because of his treatment of the sky. It's very heavy with the promise of snow, while that ground offers that lightness and the red jackets really um, offset that snow. I'm also a big fan of uh, the two dogs in the corner. They're very cute. And this is certainly a scene that many of us are familiar with. His style would change yet again. He certainly did not give up depicting realistic scenes as we can see in Turntable, which uses darker and heavier colors to convey speed and the sheer weight of the locomotives. Here again, we can see the harsh and heavy lines are softened by watercolor. So much of Sample's artistic career up to this point had been spent in California, where the color palette was much brighter. And here I think we see Sample figuring out what to do with new, the New England landscape, using darker color to symbolize the cold, etc. However, Sample would revisit the precisionist style and apply it to the New England landscape. And he produced this wonderful painting, Beaver Meadow, a scene in her very own Norwich. And this is really a culmination of his other styles and one of his most highly regarded uh, compositions. This work celebrates American folk art traditions um, and emphasizes uh, communities uh, strengthened through weekly worship. So there are a few differences which show his artistic maturity, his changes over his career. Sample now takes time to render facial features. Before, in his unemployment study, the faces were indistinguishable, and now there are hair lines and harsh shadow. In the middle ground of the painting, we can see a comment on change, the rise of the automobile juxtaposed to the horse-drawn carriage. This is really positioning Norwich as being immune to quote-unquote progress. And of course, those cute little cats are absolutely adorable in the corner. Um, but this is really, this is Sample's last painting in this style. He would change once again uh, to his very, a very different approach to the New England landscape. In this painting, we see Sample retreating still further from the gritty realities of urban industrialization to the pastoral utopia of a more agrarian lifestyle. During the late 1930s and into the 40s, Many artists revisited 16th century Dutch and Flemish styles, especially the artwork of Peter Bruegel the Elder. Notice a similar treatment of the snow and active motion into the scene. Both artists put nature in the center of the composition and humanity on the periphery. Bruegel often scorned the spirit of material enterprise in 16th century Flanders, and Sample certainly prioritizes, at least in this work, and natural beauty over the interruptions of industry. Here's another very similar approach to depicting a snowy landscape and putting crisp focus on the trees and outlines of the mountains with an eye to Bruegel's treatment of snow. These works are still under the umbrella of, a, of the American art scene movement, but are interpreted as a direct result of a renewed interest in Bruegel. Here's an excellent example of the styles we've discussed coming together and a scene many of us may be familiar with, the Norwich Pool, which used to be located on Charles Brown Brook, and unfortunately it's no longer there. I was unable to find a clear color image of the painting, but I did come across this article in the Norwich Times from 1997 about the life of Paul Sample, which included a copy. And here you can see the same sense of movement and motion and more of those uh, California colors that we saw early on. There are certainly many, many more beautiful paintings by the artist Paul Sample. We have only grazed the surface. 
but I hope I leave you with a good introduction to his life and work and have shown him as a complex and highly talented artist, hard to define through his exploration of the regionalist style. In the mid 1930s, Paul Sample was among the dozen most important artists in America. By 1950, his art was all but forgotten, having been eclipsed by the post-war triumph of abstract expressionism. America no longer had a need for Sample's more conservative style, preferring human spontaneity and irrationality that had produced two devastating world wars. However, there has been a renewed interest and renaissance in regionalism in the American scene over the past couple of years, and I hope this encourages people to look into his work. Hopefully, the Hood Museum will reopen soon, and as they hold an incredible collection of Sample's work. I hope you all may see it soon. Thank you so much for listening to this talk on Paul Sample, and I would love to open up to questions and comments. So if people have questions, you can either type them into the Zoom chat and I will read them out loud, or um, you can click on participants and raise your hand and, and we'll get you unmuted and, uh, and you can ask your question in person. Definitely. Maybe I'll give people a couple minutes to, to think about questions. It's hard to be put on the spot, but I have some questions for all of us to consider, um, some questions uh, back to you that I'd be interesting to discuss. We don't have to answer all these now, but we can certainly um, think about them after the presentation. I'd be really interested to know if you had heard about Paul Sample before this presentation. I had only heard about him tangentially between, um, in a sort of vague discussion of American regionalism. He's certainly uh, not the artist that um, is remembered for regionalism, usually Grant Wood, Norman Rockwell, et cetera. They're, they're remembered. I'd be interesting to know uh, your thoughts on besides galleries and museums, where might the regional style have been seen during the 1930s and 40s? And we discussed very briefly that these, um, the regional style was very popular for murals and for public art. Here's an example of Paul, uh, Paul Sample's mural in um, a post office in California, excursion train and picnickers in the, 19, in the 90s. And I feel like the regional style is, uh, one reason it was chosen for uh, public works is because those crisp, clear lines, they render that um, the artwork to be seen from below. If we're imagining standing in a post office and looking up, you can really differentiate these styles. Another uh, place we might see these uh, in um, in advertisements, this is a advertisement for Maxwell House Coffee, and they have used Paul Sample's work. The one on the right we saw during the presentation, the one on the left is new, um, but it's inviting us to um, really enjoy the warmth of, of, Nor of, of Vermont, but also juxtaposing it to that snow. Uh, the painting on the left is a very friendly scene. You want to go to the town, you want to um, see what's there. Uh, so they, they really, the regional style is used in many different ways, but these are just two. So it would be interesting if you had seen them anywhere else throughout your time. And then a question, what is American art to you? That's something we've been trying to answer over these last two presentations, and it's certainly a very difficult question to answer, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. And then how do you interpret Paul Sample's stylistic changes to his relationship for, with Vermont? We saw very dramatic changes from his first watercolor of Dartmouth College to Beaver Meadow, which was incredibly different to then um, his more brugal, uh, brugal-esque styles. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that, but any other questions as well, these can be, um, your thoughts on these questions can be sent to me um, or to the Norwich Library and they'll be forwarded on. So Mary Rohr um, sent in just a little story that I think is really nice to start with. And she says she learned about Paul while skiing with his son, Tim, at Ford Sayer back in the 80s. His art has always drawn me in. Um, and then we have a few questions in the chat. And I see Peter is raising his hand. So I'm going to unmute you, Peter, and uh, let you ask your question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I'm a big fan of Paul's samples. I didn't know that uh, Hood had quite so many of his. But they normally have Beaver Meadow on display, and uh, recently they had one other painting of his. 
how can we persuade the hood to display more of his pictures or maybe put on a big exhibit of sample? Absolutely, that's a, that's a great question. And I know they, I believe, so Paul Sample, he was very popular during his life and he was exhibited widely. Then during the end of his life into the 70s, it dissipated, interest just wasn't there. And in the 80s, I think that was the last time that Dartmouth College put on an exhibition of his work. And since then, there's been nothing. So yeah, I think there, I think there is a renewed interest in the style of regionalism itself. People are very interested in that American folk art tradition, um, a, a style that preceded um, really regionalist style as a whole. But I think there would definitely be interest in grounding it in uh, community history. He's a fantastic artist who I knew very little about until I saw the watercolor in the library. And I think people, he would definitely drop people in the door. So approaching the hood and, and telling them there is this interest in our local celebrity and bringing that to their attention. But absolutely. Oh, I think you're, I think you're still muted. I'm sorry, I said that. I think that if you and I and everyone uh, chip in, maybe we can persuade Dartmouth to put on a sample exhibit. Absolutely, I agree. I know it was interesting when I was doing my research, I, some of these paintings are selected because I found them very interesting, but others were selected because uh, while the hood has all these images, they don't have all of them digitized and online. Often his works will say no image available. So it'd be great even just to have them online for people to view. Um, as a starting point, but absolutely, they, they should be out on view. So we have a question in the chat from Bill, and then Paul, I see your hand is raised, so we'll get to you right after this question. Um, Bill says, do you have a sense for how Sample's work has changed in value over the years? Ooh, that's a really good question. I was actually, today, I was looking through what his work would sell for today, and smaller watercolors, it seemed they would range $800 to 1000 Big beaver meadow would probably be in the $15,000 range. So when he was selling them, I think that was about the same. It was similar value. He was popular. They were, um, they were grabbed by museums very quickly, so I'm sure they paid much higher prices for them to uh, encourage uh, Paul Sample to continue producing these works. But I think I, they may have gone down a little bit in value, but right now they hover a um, couple thousand dollars range. Great, and now Paul, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question. Thank you for such an interesting talk. And uh, there's so much of that that I had sort of known just a little of over the years. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered, you know, since he only passes in 74, there are these decades where, you know, he'd gone out of style. What do you know just in terms about his relationship to Vermont? Absolutely. What is known of his later paintings? His later paintings. And that, that's a great question. I included, we abruptly stopped in about the 1940s with his work. Um, just for the sake of time, I, I could go on for absolutely hours about his paintings, but I included some more here. Um, and this one, I'm just gonna move uh, this here. So this was in 1945, and it's already, it's very different from the smaller watercolor that we saw early on of Dartmouth and Snow. Um, for me, when I look at this, I can see, I'm, I'm reminded of architectural drawings. And um, as I discussed earlier, Paul Sample, he didn't know what he wanted to study, but at Dartmouth, he graduated with a degree in architecture. So it's interesting to see that comparison here. More people, more, um, the buildings are uh, more elaborate. He includes more, there are cars now. So there is this renewed interest in people that continues, um, but it's interesting to go through. Here's in the 1950s. This is very different from the one we just saw five years earlier. There's one person, that one person I think really stands out. You feel the, um, the loneliness his texture of the mountains is incredibly different. Um, it's sketchier. You can tell that this kind of technique, he's applied the paint um, with a very stiff brush. He wants you to see the texture um, to make it seem like there are trees. This one, it's uh, slightly similar to the last one we saw, but still there's this, um, you feel that Paul Sample is receding a bit. He's, 
um, letting nature overcome the scene. There are no people in this scene now. This one again, he goes back, he enjoyed trains quite a bit, so he puts in that detail. This is a quick study that he did in watercolor. So it's interesting to compare medium and how that changed uh, his subject matter. And then this one of the Ledyard Bridge, more people, the train is included, there's a little bit more activity. And then this one, which I think is a great one to end. Um, this was the last one I could find, 1960. Um, very few even houses now, it's becoming even more remote. So I think he had that, uh, that interest in people early on in his career, but Vermont influenced his paintings to become more remote. He enjoyed nature, he wanted it to take over a bit. So I think he, he, um, he tipped his cap to nature a bit later on in his career, and I think that's primarily what changed for him. It's interesting to see the, the one on the screen now because there's that sort of texturing that mm -hmm. is different. Like it seems like he kept experimenting uh, on through the 60s. Absolutely. Yeah, and later in his life, he, um, he, even when he wasn't taking commissions, he loved to paint en plein air. He loved to paint outside. And that's why he's really, he's well known for his watercolors because those were easy to transport. So I think he's, he's almost trying to get that effect here of watercolor by leaving some of the canvas, um, some of these lines here, that's the canvas poking through. There's, there's very little paint applied there. Um, so yeah, it is, it's quite interesting how he, um, he definitely, he experimented with so many styles throughout his life. I actually have a portrait that he did in uh, probably 1964, 1965, and it has a lot of uh, that watercolorish texture of the background. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting to see that. Mm -hmm. I know. Uh, I, no, sorry. After you. I was just going to say that. Uh, um, I he was my godfather. And uh, my memory of him really is going for walks. Uh, you know, he was a birder. And so you had to be absolutely still in the woods and he'd get very impatient if you scared birds away. But uh, it's just so interesting that there's, you see dogs and cats, but I, I've never seen any birds in his paintings. But, uh, Thinking back part of his love of the woods was certainly that. Oh, that's, that's so interesting. No, I, I'm thinking back through the ones that I've seen and the ones that I haven't even included. And it's interesting, dogs and cats are truly the only ones that appear. But thank you so much for sharing that. I, I appreciate that. We have another question in the chat from Mizuki Stone, who says, Hi, Sophie, thanks for the presentation. Is it typical that an artist's style changes so drastically over the years? I would say um, it's typical for the regionalist style. It's interesting that uh, both Norman Rockwell and Grant Wood, they started with Impressionism because that was really the turn, the beginning of uh, the 1900s. Um, and uh, was really, that was the beginning of Impressionism for the United States and this Neo-Impressionism. So all those artists started there. And then once regionalism took off, they experimented with it. They, um, everywhere they traveled, their style changed. But outside of regionalism, I think, it's, I think it's pretty rare. Usually a artist will find his niche in an academy where he's, um, where he's taught and keep with that and try to perfect that, that style. So it's quite an interesting movement to study because there is so much flux. And um, I think all these artists, they had similar trajectories, however, with uh, changing their styles. We have two questions from Stacy Cordery. The first is who did Sample inspire? And the second is how much of his art is in private hands? Do we know? Ooh, that's interesting. So the first one, who did he inspire? That's a great question. And I think, unfortunately, regionalism had such an abrupt end. You know, Jackson Pollock became very popular um, in 1963 as his, his lavender uh, splatter painting. He, I don't think it's well recorded. Paul Sample himself is, is understudied. There isn't um, a great bibliography of artists who came after, who took the regionalist style with them. I think that's one reason that uh, the Hood may be reluctant to, to put his work up because there isn't this resurgence, um, this isn't, there isn't this popularity. Um, so I don't know of anyone specific that he 
that he um, inspired. And the second question, if they're in private collections, yes, primarily they are. The Hood Museum at Dartmouth has the largest collection of Paul samples. There are a few in the South because he was born in the South um, and a few in, um, in California where he studied. So in uh, UCLA, they have a, a few of his works, but most are in private hands. If you search Paul Sample artist, um, you will come up with, um, you can buy his works. That's basically where they are. Very few museums come up in that search. Uh, so I would say about 50, 55, 60% of his work um, is in a private collection. We have a question from Taylor Rossini. Thanks, Sophie. What was the relationship between American folk art and a so-called fine arts education, like the one Sample received? Had folk art been absorbed into the teaching canon by the time Sample was studying painting? Hmm, that's a great question. So this folk art was, it was very popular in early America. So already regionalism is uh, taking it on. It's looking, regionalism is, regionalism is inspired by trying to define America by looking at um, usually the Midwest, usually regionalism is associated with the Midwest. So it's very interesting that Paul Sample applies it to Northern New England. So I would say Paul Sample, he studied at, uh, in New York City. Regionalism certainly uh, was not taught there to the extent um, that it would be in say California. Um, so I don't think that Paul Sample really I don't think he was trained in regionalism at all. It really, he came at the right time to take it on. Um, Jonas Lai, his mentor, um, who he met at uh, Saranac Lake, New York, he always told uh, Paul Sample he really disliked modern art. And I think um, Paul Sample held on to that. And that hindered his art a bit. I think the reason that we see this 1960 example here so late in his career is because Jonas Lai had encouraged him not to paint in a moderate style. He was always trying to pull the reins back on that, um, on that more contemporary look. So that's certainly something that he most likely took um, when studying at the Otis um, School in LA. I think he was trained in Impressionism. That was the most um, prominent style at the time, but not in Regionalism. So I think that was something, it's a learned, um, it's a learned style. He learned from Grant Wood, from um, this resurgence in Bruegel, Tintoretto, other, um, other uh, Renaissance artists. Um, he learned that from them, not from uh, academic uh, teaching. But that's a great question. Thank you. Sue Reed asks, why did he leave his position in California? I think, so his, um, his wife, Sylvia Howland, she was in Montpelier, um, she grew up in Montpelier and her family was all, um, they were in Vermont. So Paul Sample always had this love for Dartmouth, um, for Hanover when he was there. And the position really appealed to him. He grew tired of teaching by the end. He had taught there for quite a few years um, and taught too early on in, in his career, I think. He was just beginning to become a painter. He wanted that freedom to um, have his own studio to be able to paint what he wanted and not have those reins um, held back so much. He and his wife uh, traveled often in summer at Lake Willoughby up north and he was greatly inspired by the landscape up there and I think he just he wanted to immerse himself in it more. So we have um, two stories uh, that folks were sharing. Uh, one is a thought from Mary Rohr. She says, I think Sample's art shows his awareness of how the economic and cultural changes in American society could, should be reflected in art, especially in public spaces where his murals were located. And then Tim says, great job, thanks. I learned a lot. I grew up in Norwich about 100 yards from the Samples. They had two horses, Chief and Prince. My parents bought one of Paul's paintings from the 1960s, which we still have. It's lovely. I know it's great to have his presence still felt in Norwich and for people to have those stories. That's excellent. And then we have two more questions in the chat. Um, if anybody else has other questions that they're, they're thinking about, go ahead and um, raise your hand with the participant button or enter them into the chat. And Sophie, I'll give you the next two. Um, the first is, Colin Butler asks, 
For his works that aren't identified as to location, is there any information available as to what or where the subjects were? Oh, interesting. So for, let's see, for this one, which is being blocked, River Valley, um, that's, that's a great question. I, the Hood and the Baker Library have most of his diaries and his sketchbooks, and I think those, those locations would be recorded there. Unfortunately, there isn't any information directly on the Hood's website detailing where this might be. Besides Beaver Meadow, which of course is in the title, and Ledyard Bridge, others that he titled to a spe specific location, I don't think we know, unfortunately, where they are specifically. And then one last question from Wendy Forrester. Are there any books about his artwork separate from his autobiography or does his autobiography have a collection of his work? Oh, uh, great question. So actually the um, Norwich Library has a great resource. Um, it's a catalog produced by the Hood and it's called Paul Sample, Painter of the American Scene. And that it has a really helpful overview and uh, really good essays by art historians at Dartmouth about Paul Sample. And that's, that's an invaluable resource of a, a good uh, first, a first stop to his um, work. Unfortunately, there are very few, few books written about him besides that catalog and, of course, uh, his memoir, but um, that's the one that comes to mind. And it's, it's, it's great. It's absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I think that is all the questions that we have for today. Thank you so much, Sophie, for taking the time to talk to all of us. Great. Thank you so much for listening for those excellent questions. I really appreciate you taking the time to check in on Paul Sample and for sharing your stories. We live in such, um, it, it's so great to live in Norwich to have this local history and I hope that we can, you know, continue the conversation around Paul Sample and as, as we were saying to encourage the Hood to, to host an exhibition of his, that would be excellent. So thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. And Sophie, do you have one more um, session that you're going to give? Yes, so I believe next Wednesday we're going to be talking with two uh, local artists, Vermont artists, about um, how they have dealt with coronavirus and um, some artists and uh, people who've inspired them who've gone through similar difficulties and how they've overcome that. So it should be a really good chat and uh, more details about that will come very soon. Awesome. Well, I hope you'll all join us for that next week. Um, and thanks again, Sophie. We'll see you all soon. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.